So we've talked a little bit now about how radioactive decay occurs, what some of the ideal things that we'd like to see in terms of imaging agents are, but now how are we going to stop um, that, radioactive, that radioactivity? And I'm going to make an analogy between the planar nuclear medicine imaging camera and uh, screen film or, or digital imaging that we talked about. Because really the collimator is kind of analogous to the grid that we talked about, if you will. And that sodium iodide crystal that we're going to use in planar nuclear imaging is kind of uh, analogous to that intensifying screen or that input phosphor that we were talking about in CR type imaging. And the photomultiplier tubes and the detection electronics are analogous to the film or to the digital detectors that we're using in, in digital radiography. The major difference is that the detector in nuclear medicine also measures the time and the energy of each de de event that was occurred, not just where it happened on, on the imaging uh, detector. And ideally, that imaging is performed from unscattered gamma ray photons. So we've talked about some of the others are not gamma rays, but that undergo photoelectric absorption in that soda, sodium iodide crystal. And that shouldn't surprise us again, right? How does the crystal stop it? It interacts just like uh, electromagnetic radiation interacts with any tissue. So here's that gamma camera. On the front, we have this collimator. And I've made the analogy um, to the grid. Right. The, pro the difference here is, how do we get an image in focus in radiographic imaging? Well, we use a point source of radiation. The radiation all comes from the point source in the X-ray tube, and so therefore the image is in focus. When we give a radionuclide, a radiopharmaceutical to a patient, we end up with a distributed source of radiation. And so we really need to make sure that we only detect gamma rays traveling in a particular direction. Otherwise, our image is just going to be this absolute blur of activity traveling in all different directions. Okay, so it's really the collimator that, if you will, acts as the lens to focus the radiation so that we're only accepting it along a particular direction. Beneath that is our sodium iodide crystal. So when one of these gamma rays interacts in the crystal, we're going to get the production of lower energy visible light, which is going to be readily detected by our photomultiplier tubes. Unlike our X-ray imaging, we're, we're going to have really tiny, small detector elements because we need this really high resolution imaging that's going to occur as I really flood the patient with x-rays in a very short period of time. Here I'm going to image a longer period of time. And when these events occur, they're going to occur far enough in space and time relative to each other that I can detect each one individually. And by detecting the amount of light that I is seen by some of the adjacent photomultiplier tubes. For instance, this tube here is going to see the majority of the light from this event. The one here, a smaller percentage of that. I can actually interpolate where the event occurred by knowing how much light is detected by the few surrounding tubes that detected it from that. And the amount of light that they detect, the sum of the light that they all detect, is going to allow me to know the energy of the interaction that occurred. So I'm going to keep the time information, the position information, as well as the energy information in nuclear medicine imaging. Here's that photomultiplier tube that's going to detect that uh, event when we do that. So I've already talked a little bit about it, uh, right? They consist of that uh, scintillation crystal, the photomultiplier tube, and the electronics with that collimator mounted in front. The crystal is typically about a 3 8 inch piece of sodium iodide doped with a little bit of thallium. This scintillator needs to have good stopping power for the photons that we want to image, and it needs to be very fast because I want to record the event that occurred and immediately be able to record the next event. If it's slow, then multiple events are going to pile up on each other and it's going to be hard for me to distinguish the individual events. That light emitted is detected by those PMTs and the electronics are going to calculate that location as I talked about. 
And a typical nuclear medicine image contains about 500,000 to, oops, I missed a zero here, about a million counts, okay? So there's that picture once again. We've got those. And you've all been in the room while the imaging is going on. On the per scope that's up there, it's showing the individual events that have occurred over the last, oh, say, five-second interval or so. Let's just take a look at that sodium iodide crystal and its efficiency uh, for stopping uh, gamma rays of particular energy. So here are some different energies of gamma rays. I put down 100, 140, this is technetium. And let's just say we were working with photons that had energy up in the range of 511 like we have in PET. So here's a quarter inch thick, here's the 3 8 inch thickness we have. That's the standard thickness in a gamma camera. And a little, I've gone out to be a, a little thicker here. So notice that for 140.5 keV, that 3 8 inch thickness stops about 90% of those uh, gamma rays from technetium 99M, which is, which is very nice. Just like we talked about with our screens, right, the thicker we make this crystal, the more room we have for light to diffuse and the worse our resolution properties are going to be. So we don't want to make the crystal thick just because it has greater stopping power. So this 3 8 of an inch thick is a nice balance between resolution properties but still stopping the majority of the technetium 99M. The reason I included 511 keV uh, photons here was I want you to realize right away that this is not the right material for doing positron emission detection, right? We're only going to stop 5% of those. And wait a second, we want to stop the pair, not just one of them. So the chance that we stop the pair is going to be exceedingly small. So we're going to actually use a different type of scintillator for PET imaging. Even going out to a one inch thickness, notice that only goes up to 14%. We do this pulse height analysis. Remember what I was telling you that if you look at the total amount of light that is taken, that's the, the height of the pulse there. It's going to allow you to discern where the energy was that of, the, um, of the gamma ray that was detected. And typically we accept so that we, uh, a window so that we accept any um, events that are detected by the detector that fall within a certain window of the peak. Because let's be honest, when a 140 keV gamma ray photon from technetium strikes the crystal, it doesn't always produce exactly the same amount of light. There's going to be some slight variation. So we're going to open up a little window called the photo peak window, and typically it's about 28%. So if we're at 140 keV, we'll look 10% below that, right, which would be down to 126, and 10% above that, which would be up to about 144. Any pulses that occur whose energy is estimated to be in that range, we're going to accept and make our image from. A wider window would accept more photons, so it would decrease our noise. But unfortunately, you know, what are some of these things that have lower energy going to be? Where well, they're going to be gamma rays that have scattered in the patient. And so we don't really want to accept those. They're just going to degrade the quality of our image. By the way, certain radionuclides, like gallium-67, have more than one photo peak. They give off gamma rays of multiple different energies, and we actually set up multiple ranges in which we'll accept them. Not one big wide one that accepts all, but multiple narrow ranges centered right at where the peaks are. So here's what happens. If I start to detect uh, gamma rays coming from a patient who's been given technetium 99M, I'll see if I start to count the, the detected events in the crystals, I'll see this big peak here at 140, centered at 140. And there's that window where we're accepting these events. All these events in yellow that are occurring, we're accepting, saying, yes, those are true events that I want to use to make my image. Notice beneath that where some of these scattered events are, you, you still have some little bits of peaks. And I want to mention what some of them are from, just really a couple of things here. Notice there's one right down here just below 80. And does anyone know what that peak is from? What's that peak from? Yeah, that's scatter within the collimator. That happens to correspond 
to the characteristic X-ray energies of lead, and our collimator is made of lead. So when events interact in the lead collimator and we get some characteristic X-ray production, and we certainly don't want to include those in making our image. It's not shown here because the picture would have to be up at 280 keV, which would be up this way, but usually there's a little tiny peak situated up at 280 keV. And what's that from? Those are coincidence events where a pair of events happen to occur near simultaneously in close to the same position in the crystal. And so they can't be discerned temporally. They can't be discerned in time because they happen too close together in time. So our pulse height analyzer thinks for some reason something with 280 keV just struck the detector. Completely artifactual there, but that's one of the other things we might see. Moving right along, we'll talk a little bit about those collimators. I've uh, mentioned the analogy to uh, the grid. Um, they're typically made from lead, and they have thousands of holes in them through which the gamma rays can pass. I mentioned that they're mounted in front of that crystal, and they really act like a lens to only accept gamma rays coming from a particular uh, direction. And there's a number of different collimator designs, each providing some trade-offs between resolution, noise, and field of view. So here's a nice parallel hole collimator. It's only going to accept gamma rays that are traveling parallel to each other. Here's a pinhole collimator. It's going to do kind of the same thing that imaging and x-ray imaging does, where all of our x-rays emit from a single point source, the focal spot on the x-ray tube. Here we're just going to insist that all the x-rays we obtain count travel through, or so the gamma rays we obtain, travel through a single pinhole camera to form our image. Here's a converging hole uh, collimator. Notice it has a very similar behavior to the pinhole, the only difference being that the object doesn't get flipped and you can image closer to the object than you can for a pin, pinhole collimator. And here's a diverging hole collimator where we actually get this spreading out. The holes in the collimator actually uh, look at a larger field of view. So what, what kind of things do we image with this? Well, a lot of imaging in nuclear medicine is done with a parallel hole collimator. We used to do some thyroid imaging with the pinhole collimator where you really were looking at a small object and wanted to magnify the field of view. You know, where you have a really, a fairly small camera, so we used to have a portable nuclear medicine camera that we sent up to the uh, intensive care units to do portable VQ scans. So there the, the camera was relatively small, but we needed to see the large field of view, the chest. And so the collimator on there was a diverging hole collimator, which took that large field of view and really brought it down to the size on the face of the camera there. We talked about the fact that the, the collimator is made out of, of lead and um, oftentimes it's made out of these almost corrugated pieces of lead that when they're stacked together form these hexagonal holes, if you will. Of course, the higher energy some of these radionuclides are, here's I-131 with GS as a beta emitter, but also decays through the production of some high energy gamma rays, and they will frankly pass right through the thin lead septa of some collimators. And so you get this septal artifact where this is passing through the walls of some of these septa, and that star pattern corresponds to the orientation of the walls in that collimator. You'll see that here. Okay. The performance of the collimator is measured in terms of its resolution and efficiency, and resolution we measure just like we did in the other ways. We can have some bar phantoms, we can try to calculate a modulation transfer function, or we can image a point source or a line source and see how much that gets blurred out, that full width, that half maximum that some of you may have heard of. The sensitivity refers to the fraction of gamma rays that pass through the holes of collimator, 
In most general purpose collimators, less than one in 10,000 gamma rays that exit the patient actually make it through the holes of the collimator. So the same sort of inefficiency that we talked about with x-ray imaging, right, where only one in a thousand x-rays made it through the side of the patient. Well, there's an awful lot of gamma rays here that we're actually not utilizing to, to make our image. Increasing the length of the holes in that collimator, right, is going to improve the resolution properties, but unfortunately it's going to make the sensitivity worse, just like when we talked about the grid. Uh, in addition to the collimator types, the parallel hole, the converging hole that I showed you, the pin hole, they also tend to be uh, ba classified based on their resolution, uh, sensitivity, and energy characteristics. And some common types are high sensitivity, high resolution, low energy, medium energy, high energy. And I'm going to talk about some of those in a little bit. The, the one thing I want you to realize, too, is that the further you get from the nuclear medicine gamma camera, the poorer your resolution becomes. Okay, so if you think about it, look at the area that this particular hole in the collimator samples. Notice the further away you get, the wider that it becomes, that wider the field of view that it sees becomes. And that's really what's determining the resolution at a particular depth. So it's very important in nuclear medicine to get the object that you're interested in imaging as close as possible to the gamma camera to keep your resolution properties as, as uh, high as possible. Okay. So what are high sensitivity cameras? Well, they're ones that allow to collect as much as possible of the radiation. They tend to have short, wide holes with relatively thin septa. High resolution uh, collimators have long, thin holes. Low energy collimators, right, if you're going to image things that have relatively low energy gamma rays, the lead septa don't need to be nearly as thick. You don't have to worry as much about the high energy uh, gamma rays that might penetrate through those septa. And the high energy ones, of course, have very thick septa. Uh, 